Okay, thank you everybody for joining this new session of the Talk series. Today we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Oliver Brock, who is Professor of Robotics from the Technische Universität Berlin. Sorry for all German speakers. Uh, a little bit of bio for those who don't know him. Um, Professor Brock received his diploma in computer science from the Technische Universität Berlin and his master's and PhD from uh, Stanford University. Uh, he then pursued his research uh, at uh, Stanford University and Rice University and um, also was uh, associate and assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. And uh, finally, a few years uh, ago, he flew back to Berlin uh, where he got an Alexander von Humboldt professorship, which is, as far as I know, the most expensive uh, <laughs> research place in Germany. Um, in his lab, so the uh, Robotics and Biology Laboratory, uh, he studies how to enable robots to uh, solve complex problems in dynamic and unstructured uh, environments, uh, but also how to apply some concepts from robotics to uh, uh, structural molecular biology. But, but I guess today uh, Oliver is only going to talk about robotics and more precisely about variability and why it might be the main obstacle for us to take robots from their controlled factory environments to the real world where uh, they will need to be more autonomous. Uh, the talk should be around uh, 45 minutes long and will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, so now I give the floor to Professor Brock and please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks a lot for the warm welcome. It actually uh, feels very good to me to be welcomed by you because uh, you probably don't know this, but I have a special relationship with SoftBank. Uh, I almost bankrupted SoftBank once. Um, this is uh, in 1999 or 2000, I started a company um, together with three friends in the Silicon Valley uh, during my Stanford times. And I think SoftBank uh, invested about 100 million um, and that didn't go so well. So I think at that point there was some discussion about SoftBank, at least the venture branch, going out of business, but uh, that may be a rumor. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here. You're probably also happy that you're here, that I didn't ruin uh, your, your professional career. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk about variability, and uh, I kind of sent that title without thinking about it too deeply, and then I realized that I might have made some mistake, but I'll, I'll, I'll just roll with it. Let's see what happens. So, uh, variability. What, what is variability? Today, these days, when we think about that, we have this in mind, right? Lots of lots of images, um, ImageNet database. Uh, we consider that to be highly variable, so there's thousands of images of the same thing. Um, that's kind of variability. I think that's far from understanding what variability is about. We're, we're really focusing on something very narrow. Um, and, and I would like to keep that point throughout the rest of my talk, uh, but for you to sort of have some image in mind for what variability could look like, uh, please please keep this. So let's, let's start by looking at how do humans address variability without having defined what that really means. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna just gonna show you something. So this is a little visual trick. I guess uh, you guys don't have a microphone, so I will put words into your mouth. So what you saw first was these dots, um, these dots changing colors, and as they start rotate, it appears that the color changes sort of go away almost or get reduced, at, at, but, but that's actually an illusion. I'm going to show it to you one more time. Now try to track one dot right from the beginning to end. Keep, keep focus on one dot and you will see that its pattern of color changing actually does not vary. So what happens here? Uh, I hope, did you guys all get that? So. What happens is that motion suppresses your perception of color. 
So there's variability here in two dimensions. One is the color and the other one is motion. And it seems like one cue is superseding another one. So humans seem to deal with variability in some strange way by just ignoring it. Well, why is that? Obviously because motion is more important to us if you look at our evolutionary uh, timeline, right? Things that move are dangerous to us. Uh, things that change color are entertaining. So it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective to, to look like that. Uh, but, but this is sort of low level, right? This is vision. How, how about cognition? This is a picture you don't really need to see what's going on, but it's a list of cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are things that appear to us as flaws in our cognition. But they're not, right? I'm claiming now that they're going to help us deal with variability in a way that helps us survive because we cannot deal with all variability. So what maybe, you know, so, so these biases deal with what should we remember? There's too much information, there's not enough meaning, or we need to act fast. So all of these biases sort of drop information. Let's just give me one example. Um, that is relevant for scientists, for example. The one is the confirmation bias. It's the tendency to search for, interpret, focus on, or remember information in a way that confirms one's preconception. Right? So you already believe something, somebody gives you information, it strengthens your belief, even if the information doesn't necessarily do that. This explains a lot about what's, what's going on in politics these days. There's also something that's called um, the bias blind spot. All of us think when we hear about these biases, well, that's kind of weird. That doesn't happen to me. That's the bias blind spot. We all think that other people are subject to these, to these biases more than us. So, to sum up, this idea here is humans heavily deal with variability by ignoring it. Now, how can that be, right? It seems to have worked pretty well. So, so maybe there's a strategy here that could be useful for us in robotics. I'm going to try to give you one example of how I think this can happen. And this is going to be difficult to hold the microphone while operating my laptop, but I'll try. Okay, so, so I, we started with images. So let's, let's stick with the image example. So let's assume that we have a bunch of images. And I think images are way too limited. Right? I think images are too limited, but let's stick with that because it's a nice visual metaphor. And in the end, maybe we want to know where is food. So we want to seek information inside these images for food. One way to do that is to go very directly from one end to the other, and I think that is very difficult. Deep learning is sort of a, a hot thing these days, and I think deep learning succeeds very well because it doesn't do this direct shot, but it introduces intermediate representations. So let's call this information. So I extract some information from these images, and from, let's call this information one, and from this information I extract more, information and or some different or higher level information and so I end up understanding what food is. So, so maybe we um, in the first step identify objects and the second we identify round objects and the third we identify apples. And clearly this is not just something that happens in one channel, this happens you know maybe from some other uh, some other source, maybe let's say that these are sound files, you know I, I extract here information three, no, this, this should have been three, so this is four, and so on, right? And maybe this information here, five, actually influences this. So somehow we can integrate multiple modalities, we can integrate multiple sources of information, but in the end what we want is we want to arrive at the question of where is the food. Now what I'm going to claim is that every step along this way, we're going to have to ignore some information. We're going to start on the left, with the raw data, and we're going to keep ignoring some amount of information, but only the information that we don't need, right? This is exactly the art. If we could do that, then that's perfect, right? We, we ignore the clutter, we ignore the variability, we don't care that 
uh, door handles look very different from each other because the only thing we see is a door handle. And that's how our perception actually works. Right? I mean, I opened probably 16 door handles today. I don't remember a single one of them because they all looked like door handles to me. Okay, so, so I think this is sort of a pattern here, right? We need to go from raw data to information and every step along the way we ignore something and the key is going to be what is it that we ignore and what is it that we keep. What is it that we can do to work with this? So my, my plan is to, to, to stay at this very simple level for a moment and then to go and show you some examples of this, examples from our research. Bottom line is we have data, right? Data is in some space and we can look at that data as spots. For humans, that data that's coming in is about 300 million dimensional. We have 300 million nerve endings that are sampling the environment. So that's a high dimensional space. It makes sense for us to drop information. Right? So for example, our, uh, our eyes have about 130 million uh, nerve endings that receive uh, light in each eye. But the channel that goes to the brain is much narrower. Right? So already in the retina, there is some dropping information if you want to put it the negative way. Finding the right information, if you want to put it the positive way. Okay, so, so what can we do um, with, this, with this data? Um, we want to find the right information. And we somehow want to represent that in a way that can help us, we call it generalize, right? But somehow to use the information that we extracted. So there's a, there's a notion from machine learning that is called the hypothesis space. It's the space of all hypotheses that your learner can output. So for example, if your learner can um, output circles to stay in this very simple domain, then the hypothesis space is the space of all circles um, that are present in, in the plane. So, so maybe from this data you could say this is a circle. But this data doesn't look very nice relative to the circle, right? So, so maybe Okay, so, so, so one notion that I want to keep in mind is the hypothesis space. And if you, f you know, just want to you know, from go from the simple example to something more complicated, the hypothesis space of deep neural networks, for example, is huge. It's all functions that can be represented by the neural network, right? Which sometimes have billions of parameters. So, so here I'm looking at something very simple, just circles, x, y, and radius. So that's the hypothesis space. Another thing is though, if we redraw this data um, by going from these 300 million dimensions to not these two, but to go to, to, to other dimensions, maybe the data looks like this. And now my circle hypothesis is very obvious, right? So, so basically how easily we can interpret um, something depends on the representation. Clearly it also depends on the way I select the data, right? I, I can, I can uh, sample from the same set, but I only sample lots of points here, and it will be very difficult for me to infer the right circle hypothesis. So, so we have also the data selection. Um, there's another thing that is related to the hypothesis space, and that is, for example, um, I, can, I can have the same hypothesis space, which is circles, but I can make small circles more likely by some tuning of my algorithm. So this is called a language bias. So the idea is very simple. Um, I have some dots and I, I prefer small circles and I'm not sure if this is going to make too much sense but then you know rather than looking at the big circle I'm rather than saying this is I prefer smaller circles. So I can I can build a bias into my language. I think basically that, that these are the tools that we have. All of these 
all of these can be viewed as some form of prior. This is information that we have before we look at the data, right? I define my hypothesis space by picking uh, a machine learning tool. I usually select a representation. This is, you know, machine learning people do this most of the time by hand. I somehow, maybe, I cannot even pick the data, right? Especially in robotics, the data is the data. That, that, that is the experience that I, that I come up with. It's difficult to sort of select this. And then language bias is a, is a knob that we can tune um, to hopefully focus in on the, right, on the right data. Okay, so I don't know if it's easy for you to keep these things in mind, but I want to go through a couple of examples and examine uh, these aspects. Actually, why don't we do this for deep learning right now, okay? So I've already mentioned that deep learning has a huge hypothesis space. The representation is not really covered so much by deep learning because we just have a vector. Uh, what that vector is, the, the deep learning, the, the network doesn't care about, right? So, so we still have this aspect that we can tune this. Data selection, you know, we have huge amounts of data to make data selection a solved problem, right? So, so, and that's a problem for robotics because we would like to solve problems with few data. And then the language bias. This is, I think, the most interesting one. Because there's people that think deep learning is going to solve everything. And to me, this amounts to saying that the language bias encoded in deep neural networks is exactly the right one for solving natural problems. Right? That's, that's effectively what it says. And so, this is something that we can debate, and you can debate with yourself whether you believe that or not, that, that somehow neural networks um, just, just are the, the, have the right mojo. Okay, so let's, let's to warm up, to warm up, let's, um, let me switch back to the other view here. To warm up, let's pick a very general tool. Let's pick mathematics. Okay, so this might seem like quite of a jump, but there's a paper published by a guy called Eugene Wigner, who's a, I think he won a Nobel Prize, he was involved in the Manhattan Project, super smart guy. The unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. He said, wow, isn't it amazing that all these amazing physics around us can be captured by this simple formula? What he's saying is mathematics not only defines the right hypothesis space, it also has a very good language prior, language bias, right? Yeah, but then a couple of decades later, this other smart guy said the reasonable, though perhaps limited, effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. He said, well, it's not surprising that there is a language uh, bias because we designed mathematics to describe the things that are around us. So he's saying the, the language bias is there by design, and so it's not so surprising that mathematics um, is, is so good at describing the world around us. And then, again, a couple of years later, the next paper come up, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. And that's quite a break, right? Because before, we talked about mathematics. And now we talk about data. So these are sort of at opposite ends of the scale, right? What is the language bias of data? There is none, right? Data doesn't have, it's, that's just the data. So, so it's kind of an interesting shift, right? Before we were dealing with problems that we could very easily describe with simple formula. Now we're dealing with problems that are difficult, like speech recognition and things like that, robotics, AI, and, and we're giving up, right? We're, we're saying, okay, our tools are not good enough. Our, our ability to come up with a hypothesis space and a language uh, bias is, is, um, is not, not good enough. We're gonna just resort to data. And I guess what I would like to argue today is um, that, that we should do both. Right? So here on the one end, we have algorithms. And by algorithms, I mean also you know, formula. Um, I guess the uh, vending machine is broken. Um, so so there's, a, there's formula you know, and, and things that describe what to do. You, quick sort is an algorithm to sort things. 
you just need data to apply it. You don't need data to make your quicksort work. And here on the other end, you have neural networks. You still have some programming, right? You're programming, backpropagation, and all these other things, but most of the rest comes from data. And so, you know, this paper by Wigner is saying, this is really amazing that we can do this. The uh, surprising effect, the, uh, the uh, amazing effectiveness of data is saying, well, we should be here. And, and I think we should, as always, when two people fight, the answer is in the middle. Okay, so let's see how much uh, time I have. Um, when did we start? Okay, so I'm gonna try to show you three examples of how we effectively design language biases and design hypothesis spaces that leave the right information in. And I want to start with perception because, you know, in 2005, I was organizing a workshop uh, where we brought together roboticists and computer vision people. And there was a computer vision guy, I'm not going to say his name, in 2005, who said, what do you mean, vision is solved? Just tell us what you need and we'll give it to you. I, I, I'm hearing this again from people that do deep learning uh, because they have made significant progress in image classification that they say image uh, vision is solved. To me, vision is not image classification. If you guys are roboticists, I think you agree with me. All right, so, so I actually think that perception, if you ignore action, doesn't make much sense. I, I know that uh, Kevin O'Regan also gave a talk here, so maybe you're familiar with this. But the idea is that everybody would say this is a round plate, even though you see, as a, see it as an ellipse. Right? So, so we rarely see things that are round head on, but we still have a category of what round is. And his argument is that it's the way things change when we move relative to them. Right? He calls that sensory motor contingency. So, so this would mean that perception actually is defined through motion. There's, there's more evidence for that. This is a, a plant called, uh, a, um, what's it called? It's called the tunicate. Uh, you know, some people may know, you, may, may know this already. It's, it's something that um, goes through the ocean and at some point during its life decides to settle on a rock. And then the first thing it does, it starts digesting its own brain because it doesn't need its brain anymore because it's not moving around, right? I don't know if it has eyes that it also digests. That would be kind of logical, but I don't know. So, so, so I think perception and action are very difficult to separate. And now we can actually, I can make an argument, right? You guys are now uh, sort of already primed for looking at hypothesis spaces. I think the right hypothesis space is not just in the sensory space, it's action, sensing, across time, right? That is the right, we need hypotheses in that space. So if we do just image classification, we already, we already focused on the wrong problem as, as far as a roboticist is concerned. So, so this is now the hypothesis space, which is bigger than just S, right? Now that's a problem, but I'm claiming because we go to this space, we can put in place better language priors, better, better, better language biases. And that's what I want to argue. So, so here we have you know, an object that you know, uh, and again, variability. All of these objects seem uh, on some level very different, but on some level they're very similar because they all have inherent degrees of freedom and operating these degrees of freedom is required for operating that object's function. So, you could say these things have nothing to do with each other, but yes, they do. They have degrees of freedom. So, we, we now can ignore some kind of variability and focus on these degrees of freedom. And so, the, uh, the, uh, the idea is that um, we need to design some kind of representation, some, some kind of um, algorithm that encodes the right priors. So what did we do? Here we feed an RGBD uh, information. Here's some recursive estimation loop. You can call it feature tracking, okay? It tracks features. It passes the information about these tracked features to the next recursive estimation loop, which now aggregates the information from the features into rigid bodies. And this information about the motion of rigid bodies is passed on to the next level where we estimate a kinematic model, right? How do rigid bodies move relative to each other? 
Well, that's what's estimated based on the motion of rigid bodies, based on the motion of features. The cool thing is that there's arrows back. Once I know that two rigid bodies are connected by a revolute joint, I can inform the tracker that tracks these rigid bodies independently about how they should move relative to each other. So, so we have information flow between these three loops, right? There's also a loop through these things, there's a loop through this, that all these interconnected loops that help each other to, to do what? To extract information from very variable sensor streams. That's exactly what I said we wanted to do, right? So out here are these separate images, and here are three types of information that's, in, uh, that's, that's sort of extracted um, along, uh, along the process. And the key is that we can incorporate knowledge. This is our language bias, right? Here we know that features usually move together. Here we know rigid body physics that we can use to interpret the data. And here we know knowledge of kinematics. We know what types are in the world. So we are explicitly introducing a language bias to get at the right information. In here come super variable pictures, right, with bicycles and everything on there. And out there on the other end comes a kinematic model of that thing. We've ignored all the variability because we're using the right priors to interpret that data. Now, um, this works pretty well. This is just a quick video. This is a poor quality because it's actually the, what the robot sees. Um, the green things are the prismatic joints that it sees. And the red is the revolute joint. I'm going to speed up a little bit. People then say, well, yeah, but this is with white background. It doesn't matter. Th now there's more variability in the image because there's a cluttered uh, tablecloth. It doesn't matter because we're extracting the right variability and ignoring the wrong variability. So, so you can do whatever you want. Um, this variability will not distract this algorithm. By the way, this is the guy that is doing it. Uh, this is his uh, thesis. And you can see that his neck actually is a revolute joint. OK, so, so, so just to give you a quick idea that this pattern actually extends, right? So, so we would like to not just have one recursive estimation loop with a prior, not just have two, right? I showed, you, I showed you three. We want to have a whole network of these information extraction things. And this is exactly what we did. I cannot give you the details, but i just show you a quick video. Um, So, so here you see a robot um, pulling this handle from the outside view, and then the light gets turned off. This is actually not a problem with the video. We literally turned, well, Roberto literally turned the light off. You now see, you know, he switched the camera into the night mode, so you see um, what the camera sees. You see the, the infrared pattern. Now he turns the light back on, I think, and he has to now walk back to the camera to turn the night mode off. Um, but this is, this is what's happening. And, and here's what the robot sees. It uh, is pulling on this thing. It's, it has identified um, a prismatic joint. And it's also tracking the joint variable. And it continues to track it, even in the dark, because it's using multimodal information. We've just added some additional one of these interpreting loops. And this one is based on proprioception. And so this whole network of things actually is very robust to failure of a single one, because it's redundant information. So this is what I said, right? You, you actually have multiple of these pathways of information. And the, the, the interesting thing I find, um, that was kind of striking in retrospect. This was not motivating our work at all. But if you look at, this is, a, this is um, layers of the cortex. It turns out that there's obviously f information going one way, but also information going the other way. So just you know, a wild claim. Uh, you could think of this as a recursive estimation loop, right? There's, there's sort of this loop going on with passing information up and passing information down, right? And then on the right, you see a mapping of the visual cortex of a, I think it's a macaque monkey. And all the lines indicate which of these boxes are together, are connected somehow. So, so there's uh, some resemblance of the thing that I showed you, right? These are our boxes. Each of them exploits a particular prior, and they're all connected to each other. I don't know if this is anywhere close to the truth, but when everybody is focusing so much on the fact that we need neurons, 
Well, maybe that is the organizational pattern in the brain that is the right one to copy. Right? So, so I'm, not, I'm not trying to, um, to diminish the accomplishments of neural networks. I'm just saying there may be something else. And maybe we should look for that. Okay. So these are the, the two guys that worked on it. Mostly it's, um, it's Roberto and one of the in inclusion of, uh, of one of the modalities was also done by Sebastian. Okay, so, so the idea here is that we created a way of incorporating knowledge into the world by generating a language bias, if you want, and we are rejecting the variability and just letting the things pass that we think are the relevant pieces of information. In this case, the joints, the kinematic degrees of freedom, kinematic model of the robot. Okay. Let me stick with the topic of, of neural networks. Right? So what happened was that we were programming things. This is on the algorithm side. And then this was in 2010, the winner of the ImageNet challenge. And then in 2012 and 2014, those are the winning networks. And you, you've all seen this. So, so we, we jumped from one side, right, from the let's program everything side, the algorithm side, to the let, let do the data, do the job kind of side. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some work that Rico Jonskowski uh, is doing, and, and he's pursuing the idea that I mentioned earlier of just merging these two things. We have algorithms and neural networks, and somehow we should integrate them rather than combat between one side and the other. This is Rico. So, so the idea that, um, that we pursued just to validate if this is even possible is to say, let's pick a problem for which there is a very clear algorithmic solution, state estimation. Everybody knows Bayes filters, recursive estimation is the right thing to do. But in order to actually implement the Bayes filter, you need a motion model and a sensor model. And those things may be difficult, right? You actually have to somehow know your system or you have to uh, gather data and try out. So, so somehow we have a very clear algorithmic template and we have some components in that template that are missing. So this is an ideal opportunity for saying the algorithmic prior that's encoded in a base filter, that's super useful. We know that any solution uh, that anybody can come up with to a state estimation problem should look somewhat like that. But there's components in there that we better learn. And this is exactly what, what happened. So again, I'm not going to give you all the details, but the That was wrong. Sorry. This is the right slide. So, so you see an estimation loop, right? Outcomes, uh, belief over the states. This is prediction step, and this is the measurement update. You know those from common filter recursive estimation, um, and and really there's. There's no, no magic that happens here, right? We have a, a histogram-based representation of the state. It gets projected forward in time. That's what the prediction is doing. But it gets projected with a motion model that we don't know. And then we have a, a new belief over the state that's predicted forward in time. And we need to sync that with our sensor. But from our sensor, we need to map that sensor input the observation into something that uh, corresponds to our belief. So we need a sensor model. Those are the two things that we don't know. So we, we tried this for two problems. Here is a very simple one-dimensional localization problem. You guys uh, probably have seen this. And we just um, encoded this um, recursive estimation loop as a neural network and put two sub-neural networks in there uh, to learn the motion model and the sensor model. And, and then we applied just regular backpropagation, and these are the results. So the, this is the histogram filter. This is the, the right thing to do. And this is the gray curve. And you see it very quickly, you know, basically it starts here and it stays good. Right? It has the right motion model and the right sensor model, and it estimates the state very quickly and then tracks that state. We compared our end-to-end -end learnable histogram filter with long short-term memory architectures 
Um, these are basically deep learning architectures, recurrent neural networks with memory. Um, the good news is that we beat them, right? These are the two lines up here. Uh, and these three are the yellow, this greenish thing, and, and the dashed line. But let's ignore the dashed line for now. These two things, they both in the end are actually better than the real histogram filter. Right? You, you see that after a couple of training steps, they, they get better. How can we explain that? Well, the histogram filter, which is the gray line, assumes that the data has no, has no prior, has no bias. Sorry, no bias. But there actually is a bias, because in our example, there's walls on either end, and these states are different. If you move to the left, when you're already at the leftmost point, you do not move any further. So, so it turns out that by learning the motion model and the sensor model, our algorithm learns this and exploits this to predict more accurately what the state is going to be. Now you can call that this, you, you can say that this is uh, overfitting, or you can say this is really clever usage of the data to fit to the specific problem that you have. Just to give you um, some idea of what that looks like, So here you have um, the different states. There's a door here, door here, door here, door here. Uh, and here's time. And something is light if the robot, if the estimator thinks that's, that state is likely. The black dots here indicate the ground truth. And you see that these three, um, well, actually these four, um, well, th these three are look pretty much indistinguishable, right? I mean, they're, they're very good at tracking the state. Um, this one also tracks the state very well, and these are the two long short-term memory architectures that, as you can see, have a very wide and fuzzy distribution. So, so this illustrates, uh, is this surprising? No, it's not, right? I mean, this is a totally non-surprising result. It's totally unfair to compare to long short-term memory. It's, it's really it's unfair of us to do that because we've given our neural network a base filter. If it didn't do better than a neural network that doesn't have a base filter, it would be very surprising. So the, f the, the news here is not so much that we beat um, LSTMs. The news is that we've managed to integrate an entire algorithm into a neural network and to make that work. So, so this is one step of combining these two sides and of being able to combine something that has a very weak language bias, neural networks, with a strong language bias, an algorithm, and to combine that in a fruitful way. I think that's a very important step towards extracting the right information and towards fighting variability. Um, we also applied this to a 2D problem, and it also works very well. Let me show you something else. Another way of fighting variability. Here you see a robotic hand that is made out of silicone grab a candy bar out of a bowl. We all know that manipulation and grasping are notoriously difficult things. Why? Because of variability. Right? You move things a little bit, things don't go so well. Well, why does it work so well in this case? Because you can see the, the hand is actually sliding against the wall of the bowl. It's using the fact that the, hand, uh, that the candy bar is inside the bowl and doesn't really have to care. It's sort of scooping, right? It doesn't need to perceive the exact, structure, the ex the exact placement uh, of the candy bar. It just scoops through that. So there's a lot of exploitation of interactions between hand, the bowl, and the candy bar that makes this robust. Right, so you can imagine that if I place the candy bar somewhere differently, or if I place the ball a little bit differently, or if the hand came from some slightly different angle, this would probably still work. So somehow, something in this video fights variability. And my claim is that it is exactly this. It's exactly these interactions between hand, environment, and object. Let me try to, to explain that um, very briefly. So the idea is that we, we're sending some actuation command to our hand, but there is sort of compliant contact um, between 
environment, object and hand, and that leads to a modification of the behavior that we would see if we just opened and closed the hand in free space. So the behavior of the hand is the result of control and of that triangle of these interactions. And it's exactly that triangle I'm claiming that is making the grasping resilient to variability because these interactions are favorable. They can be unfavorable, but in the way that we've designed the hand and that we set everything up here, they're, they're, they're actually favorable. So to, to, to illustrate that, we have a very complicated information landscape, but because we, we designed uh, things the right way, we actually open up some kind of funnel, some big robust funnel in this complex landscape. And this funnel is the result of these interactions between hand, object and environment. Clearly, we can build a hand that is not capable of picking up anything, but here we build a hand that is capable of picking up things out of bowls very reliably. So for that particular case, we have created a funnel. So I guess that means that if we go back to our initial picture, of data and algorithms, of thinking about having the right language prior, and if we know what the right language prior is, we should use it, and if we don't, then let's think about using data to compensate for that. Now, given what I showed you about the hand, I would make, like to make the claim that algorithms are not just software. Actually, the hand encodes an algorithm. It's the algorithm of how to interact with the environment while grasping. So, so really what we need to do, I think, if we want to come up with robots that operate in general environments, we need to fight variability wherever we can. But fighting variability means committing to something specific. We need to know what we want to do, and then we need to extract the information that is relevant for that particular thing out of our highly variable data. And that we can do with algorithms or with data, and we need to use all of the tools that we have in order to achieve that. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, that's what I wanted to say. I think we need to, we need to not um, try to be generalists. We need to not try to solve all problems. We need to be cognizant of the fact that these problems that we want to solve are too high dimensional to solve in generality. And our only hope, and that is also what we humans do, which is what I tried to show you in the beginning, is to commit to something. Is to commit to a task and to say, I'm going to fight variability by extracting the information that is relevant to that task. And once we do that, we can actually um, design these right language biases that help us extract that. I showed to you one architecture for perception that I think is very apt at extracting useful information for a particular task out of that variable data stream. Um, and I showed to you how we can combine neural networks, low language pr prior, with algorithm, high language prior, and I showed to you how language prior can be encoded in hardware itself. So all of these three things, to me, are useful ways into the future to build general robots. And with that, I thank you very much.